As you can see, Bush History is a group affair. This is our cheering section. They've been helping us uh, all year long as we march through American history. We've got obviously a divergence of opinions and the little guy over there, well his opinion is definitely the loudest. We're going to continue this segment through from 1955 through 1970. Well now that you've met my advisors, let's bring you up to speed a little bit. We've gone through many timelines by now and now we're up to the year 1955 and today's presentation is going to deal with 1955 with the Montgomery bus boycott going all the way through to 1970 with Kent State and the invasion of Cambodia. Just to give you a little bit of what this all looks like, our timeline begins in 1955 with Montgomery bus boycott, the uh, second Brown decision known as Little Brown and the Emmett Till incident and we're going to move along through the 1950s to the 1960s and as the Cold War is really heating up in through the 1960s ultimately to 1967 and 1968 the year that everything went wrong and finally through to 1970 and Kent State. So now you've met my advisors and you've seen the scope of the timeline we're going to talk through this afternoon we're going to start right in 1955 with the Montgomery bus boycott. Of course, this is a direct result of Rosa Parks not wanting to give up her seat on the bus. It was a very bad year uh, in terms of effect, you know, things happening as part of the civil rights movement. It was very busy, more than bad. We had Emmett Till, and that was the, uh, you know, the horrible incident with Emmett Till in Mississippi as a result of coming down from Chicago and not understanding the, uh, the culture, if you want, the cultural segregation in the South and the horrible death that he faced. And we also have what some people call as Brown II or Little Brown, and that was the Supreme Court reconvening in 1955 at the request of several southern states. And the Supreme Court turns around and says, well, you are going to integrate at all, at all best speed that you can because this is taken long enough time and certainly the southern states aren't thrilled with that idea. Anyway, the Cold War was going on at the same time so what do we have here? We have the civil rights movement really starting to pick up speed after Brown and then the Montgomery bus boycott, now Little Brown and Emmett Till. The Cold War is going on. The civil rights movement is growing as you can see. In 1956 President Eisenhower is going to get the uh, Federal Highway Act passed. It's an interesting highway system built primarily with the idea that we're going to move troops, tanks, uh, trucks, a large amount of supplies in the event that we are actually invaded and we need to move troops very quickly. And he gets this bill through Congress and we get the interstate highway system built. As a result of this, it took just a number of days to move troops as opposed to the weeks that had taken earlier during the World War I time period. Anyway, so we're moving forward and as the Cold War is increasing in 1957, the Soviets are going to launch Sputnik and Americans go, oh my god! What's going on here? They've got something in space, they're going to attack us from space, and of course, we're going to have a reaction to this. And our reaction, well, our reaction is going to be that we're going to come up with NASA, and that's going to be in 1958. Same year, though, we're going to get the Little Rock 9, is going to be in 1957, and that's going to be the whole altercation between Governor Falbus of Arkansas and uh, President Eisenhower, and of course Eisenhower has to win this, but it's another separate separation issue and states' rights issue. And the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is going to be born, and that's going to be headed by Dr. King. And it's going to be a group of Southern ministers who are looking for a peaceful way to integrate and end segregation. Also in 1957, President Eisenhower is going to announce the Eisenhower Doctrine. The Eisenhower Doctrine is one of several doctrines we're going to hear throughout the Cold War. The Eisenhower Doctrine is basically saying, hey, you know what? The Middle East matters. It matters, so what we're going to do is we're going to respond to requests from Middle East nations when they ask for our help. It can be financial or it can be military, but it's part of this larger idea of containment and the actual foot, you know, boots on the ground that could possibly come out of this is going to end up being part of NSC 68. So that's going to be the Eisenhower Doctrine. So Sputnik, Little Rock, the Eisenhower Doctrine in 1957 moved directly into 1958. As I said, a reaction to Sputnik is going to be NASA. And we're going to now launch into the space race as well. 
we're also going to get our first satellite in space because they have one and now we want one and you know the, how that's going to work. This is part of the technology race. And we're going to get the National Defense and Education Act, which is going to be a look at the American system to revamp for math and science. On the heels of all of this, in 1959, we're going to get Castro coming to power in Cuba, displacing the Batista government. And he, strangely enough, he comes to power in 1959 when President Eisenhower is in office. And then he's going to be there through Kennedy, through Johnson, through Nixon, through Ford, through Carter, through Reagan, through Bush 1, through Clinton, through Bush 2, and he's still around into the Obama administration. So Castro certainly is going to have the last laugh here. But nevertheless, Castro is going to come to power in 1959, and the same year Nikita Khrushchev is going to visit the United States as a goodwill gesture from the Soviet Union. So in one way the Cold War is heating up, and in another way Nikita Khrushchev is trying to back off a little bit from the severity of it. We're going to get the U-2 incident in 1960 when um, the Soviets are going to shoot down, shoot down one of our spy planes. Of course, we're going to claim that we don't have any spy planes. No, we wouldn't do that. And then what happens is they march out Gary Powers, and he was the, uh, the pilot of the U-2, and all of a sudden we look pretty silly. Because not only did they shoot down our plane, they have our pilot. So it's, it's an embarrassing incident for the Eisenhower administration. Also in 1960, because you have to get for, remember now that the Civil Rights Movement is going on as the Cold War is going on, we're going to get the Greensboro sit-in in Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's going to be part of the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, kind of an offshoot of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This is now going to be a group of students, once again, trying to use civil disobedience to fight segregation. And moving along a little further, in 1961, we're going to get Freedom Rides. Freedom Rides are going to be an attempt to test segregation laws on transportation, on interstate transportation. It's going to be a bunch of uh, northern activists. They're going to come down from as far as New York and Washington, D.C. They're going to ride buses through the South, through the segregated South, to see what happens. Well, it's going to end up as a disaster. The uh, segregation is going to come out, they're going to burn buses, it's going to make national TV, and it's really going to inflame the situation in terms of the huge difference in the way people look at segregation in the United States and racism in the United States. During 1961, we're also going to get the Bay of Pigs, and that's going to be the horrible idea to try to overthrow Castro by Cuban exiles. The CIA is going to back these Cuban exiles, they're going to train them, and then we're going to pull the support at the last minute. These Cuban exiles, who were not soldiers, they were never intended to be soldiers, they were simply people who fled the Batista government, think they're going to ferment a revolution back in Cuba to overthrow Castro, but they're not that popular. And John Kennedy at the last minute pulls air support. So we're not going to support these people as they're trying to invade Cuba, because we're not going to support them on the beaches with our fighters and they're going to quickly lose to the Castro government and Castro military. Also in 1961, to continue with the civil rights idea, the Albany movement is going to be a series of meetings in Albany, Georgia to discuss what to do about segregation and racism and how to best combat it using nonviolent means. Moving along into 1962, it's a very busy time, we're going to get the University of Mississippi with James Meredith, and the University of Mississippi is going to integrate and it's going to be another big issue. He's going to be the first black person at the University of Mississippi. And during the same year, we're going to have the Bay of Pigs, this failed attempt by Cuban exiles to overthrow Castro. They were trained by the CIA, but they weren't really soldiers. They were business people, and they thought that if they went back to Cuba, that they would be able to start a revolution and get the anti-Castro forces to overthrow him. But Castro was very popular in the early part of his uh, his tenure, so to speak. So there's not a lot of support for overthrowing him, and there was a lot of support against these exiles because they fled. And not only that, the Kennedy administration, trying to distance themselves from this invasion, they withdraw air support. So there's no air support as these people trying to invade Cuba, which meant it would be a disaster and they would lose miserably to Castro's forces. Now, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, we're going to get Rachel Carson writing her book, The Silent Spring. And The Silent Spring talks about springtime without bees and without 
animals and without birds and she's attributing to environmental pollution most notably things like DDT and pollution that gets into the water cycle and we spray our golf courses with it, it rains, it goes into the local stream the animals and the fish drink from that stream and then we end up eating some of that food and now we've ingested these horrible chemicals and that's going to event essentially be the beginning of the environmental movement in the United States and that's going to be Silent Spring in 1962. On the heels of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1963 we're going to get Betty Friedan writing The Feminine Mystique and in The Feminine Mystique she has a, a very frank discussion about there is an impression that women are happy with their lives, that they're happy uh, being soccer moms, that they're happy planning meals, that they're happy taking their kids around, that they're happy running the house. Now in the book she doesn't say they're typically unhappy with this. What she does say is that they feel unfulfilled, that they believe there should be more and it's a fallacy that women are happy with this lifestyle. Um, initially it doesn't gain a lot of press and a lot of response, but as the women's movement grows during the 1960s, it'll be looked at more and more as a landmark book about the roles of women and about the inequities that they have to deal with in society. 1963 is a very big year. In June of 1963, Medgar Evers is going to be assassinated while his children are outside playing in front of his house. They're asking you to watch. Also in 1963, in May and June, um, Birmingham riots, which actually occurred before Medgar Evers' assassination, and uh, Medgar Evers had just come back from listening to John Kennedy's speech about the riots. So the order goes, Birmingham riots in May of 1963, the response by the Kennedy administration, and then Medgar Evers being assassinated on June 12, 1963, which all this becomes the impetus for John Kennedy allowing the March on Washington in August of 1963, which we know culminates in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And this is that huge, that huge rally in Washington that King becomes famous for. He's the final speaker and he talks about this idyllic world where black children and white children are playing together and getting along very nicely. Very, very dreamlike, a nice idea for sure. Shortly thereafter, we can't forget that there are other things going on in the United States. And on November 22, 1963, John Kennedy will be assassinated. John Kennedy has a lot of enemies. Some people think he's assassinated by the ultra-right-wing racist crazies in the United States because of his association with the Civil Rights Movement. Some people think he's assassinated by the CIA because he doesn't invade Cuba during the Cuba Missile Crisis. He also has sicked his brother Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, on the mafia, so some people think of the Mafia has something to do with it, but ultimately uh, it was concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald uh, assassinated John Kennedy in Dallas that day on November 22, 1963. To this day, the conspiracy theorists are trying to examine the evidence and say it's just not possible that it came out this way. Don't know. This is what we've got right now. Anyway, so now President Johnson becomes president, never really expecting to be president of the United States. He had been content to be the opposite of John Kennedy, being a former Dixiecrat and from Texas, but he will become president of the United States. And in 1964, he issues the, what's called the Gulf of Tonkin announcement over the Gulf of Tonkin incident, in which he turns around and says that North Vietnam has attacked American ships off its coast. This is highly debated, but he gets on TV anyway and he announces this, and um, Congress turns around and supports him in what's called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and gives President Johnson any, all power he needs to defend Americans in Southeast Asia. And of course, this is going to be a big buildup in troops that's going to follow this very quickly. And the funny thing about it is uh, when Daniel Ellsberg publishes the Pentagon Papers in 1971, it's really going to bring into question whether this Gulf of Tonkin actually happened or not. The same year, Johnson announces the war on poverty. He wants to eradicate poverty in the United States, and he's going to connect that to his great society. So this is his big push in, um, in his administration to become the second Franklin Roosevelt. On the cultural side of things, the Beatles come to the United States in 1964, just for a little bit of, uh, of levity in this discussion, so don't have to be so serious about all of it. The 24th Amendment will pass in 1964. That's going to outlaw poll taxes as the civil rights movement continues. We're going to get uh, 
a, for the first of a series of civil rights acts that passed in 1964, once again dealing with voter procedures. And moving forward a little bit, we're going to go into 1965 now. In 1965, the Great Society is actually going to be termed, and it's going to be a, several programs during the Johnson administration, to include Medicare and Medicaid, affirmative action is going to become part of it, in which he really wants to improve American society, and really what he's looking at, he's looking at people who are below the poverty level. So this is all part of his war on poverty. And he does. He cuts the poverty level in half while he's president of the United States. Unfortunately, the burden on the other shoulders of the Vietnam War. It's can he fight poverty and fight the war in Southeast Asia at the same time. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult and history looks in a very split way. They look at him as being a wonderful champion for minority rights and a wonderful champion uh, against poverty in the United States. And they also look at him as a failure because of his escalation of the Vietnam War. It's hard to separate the two and it's unfortunate. So anyway, during 1965, we're going to have uh, Bloody Sunday, which is the whole, uh, the whole uh, Selma march for voting registration from Selma to Birmingham. And uh, it's going to be a tremendous altercation between state police and protesters. And it's going to be on the Pettus Bridge of all places, just so I remember that one. Nevertheless, it's going to go down as Bloody Sunday. It's going to be just short of a massacre of these people who are marching for voter rights. Malcolm X will be killed in 1965. He's been speaking out against the Nation of Islam. And the, you know, um, the uh, Reverend Elijah Muhammad and his activities within the Nation of Islam is actually killed by his own people and his family's watching. His killers have never been caught to this day. But he symbolized the other side of the civil rights movement. Malcolm X was more for separatism and for black pride. You could say that the rise of Malcolm X and the death of Malcolm X gives rise to the whole black power movement, which will start shortly thereafter. We'll get the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which is a continuation of cleaning up voting procedures for minorities. The South is continuing to try to do whatever they can to stop voter registration and voting procedures from working in minorities favor and the Voting Rights Act is basically going to call for federal monitoring of voting procedures in the South. It's only in states that have a history of trying to deny voter rights for their population. Moving forward, we're going to go into 1966, the Black Panthers with Bobby Seale are going to be born in 1966. Also, we get the National Organization of Women. This basically takes everything that Betty Friedan had been talking about in the feminine mystique and decides that we're going to have this organization for women's rights. As I said, black power, the women's movement is taking off, the anti-war movement is really escalating. One thing we have to also mention is during this time period, the Immigration and Nationality Act passed through Congress. The Immigration and Nationality Act basically is going to remove quotas from uh, Eastern countries and from Asia, largely due to the Cultural Revolution and the persecution of intellectuals in China. But now the floodgates are going to open up. We're going to have a huge amount of immigration from Asia coming into the United States. The Detroit riots begin in the summer of 1967. Police had raided an after-hours bar in a largely black neighborhood. And because of their heavy-handed approach, there was a big disturbance that occurred following it. And uh, somewhere in the low 40s, where the amount of people actually died as a result of those riots, uh, similar in, in totals to what happened in 1863 in the New York draft riots. Again, another, another event as part of the civil rights movement in which black society felt like it was being victimized and needed to stand up against white government and white suppression. Moving forward, we get into 1968. 1968 is the year that I like to call the year that everything went wrong, and it did. It starts out peaceful enough. There's a ceasefire in Vietnam, but that ceasefire in Vietnam for the Tet New Year is what it was called, for the Chinese New Year, which was called Tet, uh, was not being observed all over Vietnam, and there's a big buildup, especially around Khe Sanh. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, North Vietnamese started jumping out of the backs of trucks, from, the backs of, from sewers, from uh, you know, little roadside produce stands where, where people we thought were friendly were pulling weapons out, and it was this huge attack on a bunch of cities in South Vietnam, including Saigon. It went on for a while, and it made us look like we were indeed vulnerable. They actually attacked the American embassy in Saigon while this is going on. Now, ultimately, 
Tet was not a military success, but it was a PR success. As we watched this on live television, and the American public realized that, you know, we might not win this war, because these guys are pretty good at this stuff. They're pretty good at surprising us. It's a whole idea. Again, you know, you're fighting an armed civilian population. And when you fight an armed civilian population, you are at a disadvantage. It happened during the American Revolution, as an example. The British were fighting us, and we're an armed population. We know how that worked out. Uh, it happens in the Philippines when the Philippines are fighting against us after the Spanish-American War. And again, the uh, death totals were very high. And it happens again in Vietnam, in the Tet Offensive. During that same year, right after the Tet Offensive, Martin Luther King is going to be assassinated. And there are riots across the United States because of that. And the only one that can stop those riots is Bobby Kennedy. And Bobby Kennedy comes and he speaks to people about these riots and he, he gets up. Uh, black society to realize this was a lone person who killed Dr. King and while it was a horrible tragedy, we need to calm down if we're going to fulfill Dr. King's dream of uh, peace between the races and a, a nation where black children and white children can play in harmony and where adults can get along with each other and ultimately end this whole idea of racism. But then what happens is in June, Bobby Kennedy is killed. So now Bobby Kennedy is assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan. So here is the hope, here's the hope of some kind of, of peace in the United States and the hope of ending the, the Vietnam War, he comes to a bloody end when he is clearly the, fr the front runner in the race for the presidency because Lyndon Johnson has decided he's not going to run again. He probably wouldn't have gotten elected anyway, but he's not going to run again and Bobby Kennedy looks like he is you know, the, uh, the person waiting to be the next president of the United States, now he's going to be killed. So it's not a good year at all. One good thing that does happen, the Civil Rights Act of 1968 is passed, and this further opens up housing, and it also is aimed at other minorities. We tend to think of the Civil Rights Movement primarily as a black-white thing. The Civil Rights Act of 1968 also includes American Indians, and Native Americans are now going to get a step up for the first time as part of the Civil Rights Movement. Moving forward, Richard Nixon is going to become president in January of 1969. He's going to win the 1968 election. And he announced this policy of Vietnamization. Vietnamization is the idea that the Vietnamese need to fight their own war. And that Americans should teach them how to fight their own war. And that we will withdraw from Vietnam. It sounds very nice. It doesn't work because there's not a, uh, a real strong feeling amongst the South Vietnamese that this is a war that they're going to win against the North Vietnamese anyway. So the idea that we're going to hand the, uh, the, bat, the fighting over to them is flawed. It's an interesting idea, but it's flawed because it simply doesn't work. But it's handing the Vietnam War over to the Vietnamese to fight, hence the idea of Vietnamization. In July, we're going to get the moon landing. We're going to get Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, and we're going to get the one small step for man idea, and Basically, the United States wins the space race. John Kennedy promised it, and we do it in July of 1969, and Apollo 11 lands on the moon. And the Soviets never get to the moon. A lot of people don't realize that. The Soviets give up. They turn their attention to how long can people live in space. So they start building space stations for extended, uh, extended time in space by their cosmonauts. In the summer of 1969, we're going to get Woodstock, the famed peace and love and music concert that's going to occur in Bethel, New York, not in Woodstock, New York. Uh, Woodstock denied the permits, and it's going to be held at Max, Max Jasker's farm in Bethel, New York, and it's going to be legendary. You ask people who are in their 50s in the United States today, how many went to Woodstock, and you get so many hands that Woodstock never could have accommodated all those people. A lot of them are just saying it. They really didn't end up in Woodstock. Now we're going to go into 1970. The peace and love gen uh, generation is going to enter the 1970s. And Richard Nixon has double-crossed us. He's turned around and he said he's going to withdraw troops from Vietnam and start to bring them home. Well, it really redeploys them. And we start to bomb Cambodia. We start to bomb Cambodia and basically we are going to make the Vietnam War larger as we go into Cambodia and Laos. So at Kent State in Ohio, there's a protest against this escalation of the war under the Nixon administration. And this protest turns bad. It turns bad when the protesters indeed get ugly and they start throwing things at the National Guard troops who've been called out to try to keep the peace. 
but the National Guard troops show up with weapons with live ammunition. No rubber bullets here, this is live ammunition. Things get ugly, a shot f is fired, and the uh, National Guard troops end up killing students at Kent State in Ohio. And it's going to get very ugly on TV because there is little distinction between troops fighting in Asia now and the National Guard trying to keep the peace at Kent State when they indeed turn around and they actually kill, uh, they kill students at Kent State in Ohio. And President Nixon's comments on TV are not much better. He is not overly sympathetic and you know, actually blames the demonstrators for part of what occurred. To this day, we're not really sure exactly how this went bad. Certainly the troops didn't go to Kent State with the idea that they're going to kill uh, students. And certainly the students didn't think that this was going to get this ugly. It was a horrible incident, but really uh, you know, a symbol of the dysfunction in the United States at the time. So we begin the 1970s with the Nixon administration in trouble, with the uh, Ohio State National Guard killing students at Kent State campus and the Vietnam War being escalated as opposed to being uh, turned back a little bit and Nixon basically looking pretty bad and the generation gap in the United States being very wide. It's important to mention in the midst of this whole Kent State Cambodia catastrophe that the EPA is going to be born. That Richard Nixon is going to uh, start the EPA He's going to use Rachel Carson's A Silent Spring as an impetus for we've got to do something about the environment. And we're going to get the first Earth Day. So the 1970s begins with kind of a mixed message.